Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! I want him to go in at the absolute highest level. And I think to do that, you have to go through this. If it takes a little delay, it'll take a little delay. The Senate Judiciary Committee has announced it will hold another hearing on Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh next Monday. Following accusations, he attempted to rape a 15-year-old girl at a party while he was in high school. Both Kavanaugh and his accuser, Professor Christine Blasey Ford, will testify. We'll speak with The Intercept's Ryan Grimm. He was the first to report Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein had a secret letter from Dr. Blasey Ford. Then to the floods in North Carolina. The last time this happened, it was Matthew. And now, the, I believe the worst is yet to come. I believe uh, if they say the, uh, the water rising is going to mess up the Cape Fear about another 20, 25 feet. As the death toll from Hurricane Florence reaches 32, some undocumented immigrants in the region fear they'll encounter immigration enforcement if they seek help. This comes as the Trump administration has shifted $10 million from FEMA to ICE. And this week marks the 10th anniversary of the collapse of the U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers that triggered the onset of the global financial crisis. It's also the seventh anniversary of Occupy Wall Street they're doing here is the assembly. The core demand, I think, right now seems to be um, the, de- the, the right to organize, to have a political conversation in a public space, to show Wall Street, uh, so to speak, what democracy looks like. We'll speak with Nathan Schneider, an activist with Occupy, whose new book outlines an alternative economic model based on cooperative ownership. It's called Everything for Everyone, the radical tradition that's shaping the next economy. All that and more, coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Trump administration's once again slashed the number of refugees allowed to resettle in the United States. On Monday, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo announced the new cap on refugees would be an historic low of just 30,000 next year, down from the current level, 45,000. But the actual number of refugees allowed in the country is expected to be far lower. Amnesty International National decried the move as a, quote, all-out attack against our country's ability to resettle refugees, both now and in the future, unquote. Under President Obama, the refugee cap reached 110,000. Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Chuck Grassley has announced the committee will hold another hearing on Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh next Monday, following accusations he attempted to rape a 15-year-old girl at a party while he was in high school. Both Kavanaugh and his accuser, Professor Christine Blasey Ford, will testify. Ford told The Washington Post Kavanaugh and his friend pushed her into a bedroom during a party and that Kavanaugh then forcibly pinned her down on a bed, tried to pull off her clothes. She says she tried to scream, but that Kavanaugh put his hand over her mouth to silence her. Kavanaugh has denied the accusation. Dr. Blasey Ford identified Kavanaugh's friend as the conservative writer Mark Judge. Judge once wrote a book about his high school days titled Wasted, Tales of a Gen X Drunk. The book describes being an alcoholic in high school and even features a cameo by someone he calls Bart O'Kavanaugh, who puked in someone's car and passed out on his way back from a party. On Monday, Republican Senator Susan Collins welcomed the additional hearing. That does make it very difficult, and that's why it's important that there be a very thorough interview and that we see both individuals respond to the allegations. There are an awful lot of of questions, inconsistencies, gaps, and uh, that's why, to be fair to both, we we need to know what happened. We'll have more on Judge Brett Kavanaugh after headlines. 
In news from Syria, a Russian reconnaissance aircraft was shot down earlier today by a Syrian surface-to-air missile over the Mediterranean Sea, killing all 15 people on board. The incident occurred at the same time Israeli fighter jets were carrying out a series of bombings in the Syrian province of Latakia. Russia has accused the Israeli aircraft of pushing the Russian plane into the line of fire of Syria's air defense system. In other news from Syria, the leaders of Russia and Turkey have announced plans to create a new demilitarized zone between rebels and government forces in Syria's Idlib region. It remains unclear if Syria will go along with the plan. In news from Yemen, the U.S.-backed Saudi coalition is being accused of a bombing a Yemeni radio station Sunday, killing four people, including three employees of the station. The Committee to Protect Journalists condemned the attack. Tens of thousands of North Koreans welcomed South Korean President Moon Jae-in as he arrived in Pyongyang today for his third summit with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. The leaders are reportedly working on a statement to declare the end of the Korean War, a move opposed by the United States. The death toll from Hurricane Florence has reached 32, while the rivers and the Carolinas continue to rise from the record-breaking storm. Tens of thousands of homes have been damaged. The city of Wilmington, North Carolina, remains largely cut off from the rest of the state. On Monday, North Carolina Governor Roy Cooper warned the worst flooding may still be to come. This is an epic storm that is still continuing because the rivers are rising in certain parts of our state. Some areas have not seen the worst flooding yet. So this is a monumental disaster for our state that affects many of our counties, <clears throat> many of our people. The rains have also swamped coal ash dumps and open-air hog manure pits, adding to the storm's devastation. Duke Energy says 2,000 cubic yards of coal ash, not 20,000 cubic tons, as we reported Monday, were released amidst Tropical Depression Florence's massive flooding in North Carolina. That's enough ash to fill roughly 180 dump trucks. The toxic ash could run off into the nearby Cape Fear River. Meanwhile, a massive typhoon in Southeast Asia has killed at least 74 people in the Philippines and forced more than 3 million people to evacuate their homes in China. Scores more are feared dead following a landslide in the small Philippines mining town of Itagan. Many died in a chapel where they had taken shelter. Meanwhile, in Nigeria, at least 100 people have died as torrential downpour and floods continue to plague the south and central regions. A national disaster has been declared in the most affected regions. Residents in the south-central port city of Lakoja were displaced due to flooding. This is Blessing Solomon. When the water was coming, we were thinking that maybe it was just an ordinary rainwater. So we didn't even think that maybe the water would come like this, you understand? So we just like the first room, the, enter, uh, the water entered the first room. We thought it was a joke. Then it went... When the water came to my own room, that was when we knew that, yes, the water was, is very serious, you understand? So everybody just, like, pack, because even some people don't have, even have where to go, just like me. I don't have where to go, but I just, like, let me just court with some of my friends in uh, Filele. In Gaza, an Israeli airstrike killed two Palestinians near the border fence with Israel. The two men were discovered by medics on Monday night. The Gaza Health Ministry is reporting at least 26 Palestinians were shot on Monday during protests. Meanwhile, in the occupied West Bank, a 24-year-old Palestinian man died earlier this morning while in custody after he was arrested during an Israeli military raid. Pakistan's new prime minister, Imran Khan, has announced plans to grant citizenship to anyone born in Pakistan. The announcement is a departure from the current policy and could drastically change the lives of Pakistan's massive refugee populations. Khan said, quote, those Afghans whose children are born here and have grown up in Pakistan will also, we will also, God willing, get passports for them, unquote. According to U.N. numbers, close to one and a half million Afghan refugees who were born in Pakistan Pakistan could benefit from the policy. Bengali refugees in Pakistan, which include the Rohingya community, could also be granted citizenship. 
In Chicago, the trial of Jason Van Dyke, the police officer who killed Laquan McDonald, is underway. On the opening day of the trial, the jury was shown the now viral dash cam video showing Van Dyke shooting the unarmed African-American teenager 16 times as he walks away from them. Van Dyke faces two counts of first-degree murder. He's the first police officer in Chicago to stand trial for killing someone on duty in 50 years. Last year, three Chicago police officers were indicted on felony charges for conspiring to cover up the facts of McDonald's shooting. Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel has also been sharply criticized for his response to the killing, namely in the delayed release of the dash cam evidence. The Miami Herald reports a former police chief in Biscayne Park, Florida, pleaded guilty to a conspiracy charge of depriving three innocent African-American men of their civil rights by framing them. Ramundo Atasiano admitted to directing police officers to frame innocent men in cases of unsolved burglaries and break-ins to benefit his department's crimes record. Atasiano had previously boasted about the department's success rate. He reached a plea deal with the U.S. Attorney's Office and will face sentencing in November. President Trump has taken the unusual step of ordering the intelligence community to declassify a trove of documents and text messages related to the ongoing investigation into Russia's alleged meddling in the 2016 election. The documents include the FISA warrant application targeting Trump campaign foreign policy adviser Carter Page, as well as the text messages related to the Russian probe of a number of former high-ranking FBI and Justice Department officials, including former FBI Director James Comey, as well as Andrew McCabe, Peter St Struck Lisa Page and Bruce Orr. Congresswoman Adam Schiff, the top ranking Democrat on the House Intelligence Committee, criticized Trump, calling his move a clear abuse of power. And in media news, Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff has and his wife Lynn have purchased Time magazine from Meredith Corporation for $190 million. Time magazine is the latest publication to be purchased by a billionaire. Earlier this year, biotech billionaire Patrick Sunshang bought the Los Angeles Times and San Diego Urban Tribu the San Diego Union Tribune. Two years ago, conservative billionaire Sheldon Adelson bought the Las Vegas Review Journal, and in 2000. 13, Jeff Bezos acquired The Washington Post. The Texas State Board of Education has voted in favor of removing certain content from the required social studies curriculum in order to, quote, streamline the curriculum. Historical figures that may be dropped include the deaf-blind civil rights socialist pioneer Helen Keller and Hillary Clinton, the first female presidential nominee for a major party, who both scored low on the board's grading system. The Republican majority board's decision will undergo a final vote in November after a period of public response. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Senate Judiciary Committee Chair Chuck Grassley has announced the committee will hold another hearing on Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh next Monday, following the accusations he attempted to rape a 15-year-old girl at a party while he was in high school. Both Kavanaugh and his accuser, Professor Christine Blasey Ford, will testify under oath. Ford told The Washington Post that Kavanaugh and his friend pushed her into a bedroom during a party and that Kavanaugh then forcibly pinned her down on a bed and tried to pull off her clothes. She said she tried to scream, but that Kavanaugh put his hand over her mouth to silence her. On Monday, her attorney, Deborah Katz, called the incident an attempted rape. She spoke on CNN. She clearly considers this an attempted rape. She believes that if it were not for the severe intoxication of Brett Kavanaugh, she would have been raped. The accusation and issued a new statement Monday that, quote, I have never done anything like what the accuser describes to her or to anyone, because this never happened. I had no idea who was making this accusation until she identified herself yesterday, Kavanaugh said. Dr. Blasey Ford identified Kavanaugh's friend as a conservative writer, Mark Judge. Judge once wrote a book about his high school days titled Wasted, Tales of a Gen X Drunk. The book describes being an alcoholic in high school and even features a cameo by someone he calls Bart O'Kavanaugh, who vomited in someone's car and passed out on his way back from a party. 
On Monday, Republican Senator Susan Collins welcomed the additional hearing and said if Kavanaugh lied about what happened, that would be, quote, disqualifying. It's important that there be a very thorough interview and that we see both individuals respond to the allegations. There are an awful lot of, of questions, inconsistencies, gaps. And uh, that's why, to be fair to both, we need, we need to know what happened. Obviously, if Judge Kavanaugh has lied about what happened, that would be disqualifying. The accuser, Dr. Christine Blasey Ford, is a professor at Palo Alto University in California who teaches in a consortium with Stanford University, training graduate students in clinical psychology. Monday's hearing comes just 50 days before midterm elections. Meanwhile, Democrats have called for the FBI to reopen Kavanaugh's background check investigation. Senator Richard Blumenthal told The Washington Post, quote, if there's a hearing before that investigation, the committee is going to be shooting in the dark with questions. For more, we're joined here in our New York studio by Ryan Grimm, Washington, D.C. bureau chief for The Intercept. Last week, he was the first to report that Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein had a secret letter describing an incident involving Kavanaugh and a woman in high school, and that Feinstein was refusing to share it with her Democratic colleagues. His new piece is headlined, Attorney Sent Letter to Tuck Grassley and Dianne Feinstein Claiming Federal Court Employees Willing to Speak About Brett Kavanaugh. Ryan, welcome back to Democracy Now! Well, let's start with the TikTok, if you will, sure. of how all this was revealed. You were the right. one who broke the story of this secret letter. Right. And if you kind of piece together my reporting uh, with Ronan Farrow's reporting, who's done some very interesting work on this, too, you find that on July 6th, she first she first sent a letter to Anna Eshoo, her, her local congresswoman. And you're uh, saying her because she was anonymous at the at time. This, at this time, she was anonymous. She told her friends, we, we now know from a Mercury News story around that time, she warned them. She said, I've, I've, I've reached out to a Washington Post tip line. I've also reached out to my congresswoman, and I plan to reach out to my senator, and the world is going to come down on me. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take the plunge. This is a decision that I've made. So this, this was July. Diane Feinstein says that she can't recall if she spoke with uh, Ms. Bla Dr. Blasey Ford after getting the letter. Her office says they did sp that Feinstein did speak to her. In any event, as August unfolded, she witnessed the way that Kavanaugh's nomination was marching forward, and for some, you know, for some reason, decided to walk back. Ronan Farrow has reported that Feinstein wanted to make the kind of legal argument against Kavanaugh rather than a personal argument against him. And so in all of this context, she decided, OK, you know what? Maybe this isn't the right time. Why, why destroy my life if Democrats are just going to roll over and she's just going to be confirmed anyway? So in the last week or so. And meanwhile, during right. this time, uh, did Feinstein notify any of the other members of the committee about what she had? No, uh, no. And so it, somehow word leaked out to some other members of the committee <laughs> in the last week or two. And they came to her and said, you know, we appreciate the role of confidentiality. We, we, we respect uh, you know, vict victims' rights here. But we don't necessarily want you to unilaterally make the decision on whether or not this letter should be sent to federal authorities, whether there should be further investigation, whether we can speak to the victim and talk to her about coming forward. And she refused. She said, no. Uh, this I'm, is I'm Dr. Christine. No, this is, oh, this is this Feinstein. Is Feinstein. She said, no, I'm not, I'm not going to share the letter. And so once you have a dispute among Democrats on the committee like that, it's only a matter of time until it gets into the press. So I, so I had sources telling me about this dispute, that there were Democrats on the committee who wanted to privately view the letter, not that they wanted to out the victim, uh, not that they wanted her to release the letter even, but that they wanted to just view the letter privately to see what these allegations were, to see whether or not there needed to be a ratcheting up of, of this situation. And so after my story came out, there was a meeting of the committee Democrats, and they pressured her. They said, you've got to do something. And so at that point— What she, could be her logic for not sharing it with the other members of the committee? Not saying she's going to raise it, but— Not to get in her head, but the she has taken a much more conservative approach to, to this nomination, where, you know, they her, her fellow committee members were disrupting the hearing. Uh, Cory Booker, uh, you know, famously released 
uh, private documents, which turned out not to be private. But, you know, there, there, there's been a lot of theater. And so perhaps— Facing expulsion from right, the Senate. Right, And so he's bring it on. And so perhaps she worried that if she shared it, uh, although she could have redacted it, but if she shared it, that, that it would eventually leak out. And to be sure, once other committee members did find out about it, it did. It did get out into the press. So and what she would, would be, be the rationale for not at least notifying the FBI that there was other information that they may have to look into for uh, into Kavanaugh's background? Right. The, the rationale there would be once once you notify the FBI, the FBI puts that document uh, in in his background file, and that background file is accessible to other committee committee members. And once it's accessible to other committee members it may leak out into the public. So then, Senator Feinstein, though it sounds like, at least according to Dr. Blasey's lawyer, um, uh, who felt that it was Dr. Fe that was Senator Feinstein who did the right thing, and she was uh, somewhat appalled that it got out, apparently. Right. Um, I mean, then Senator Feinstein is stopping even the FBI investigating a possible crime. Right. And so what's also interesting is that we, we and we're going to learn more about this over the, the years and decades to come. Did did Feinstein ultimately get permission to send it to the FBI last Thursday? You know, she has been saying for you know that since July, she didn't turn it over on principle. You know, did did she cave on that principle because she was under pressure from her her Democratic colleagues or did she reach out? Uh, her, her attorney says that that Feinstein had not had not reached out. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see about that. But, uh, you know, it, it, she, she made the judgment that it became untenable to hold it back. It has had the effect of, in some respect, discrediting the allegations, because now Republicans are saying, oh, this looks like a last minute thing, that you're, you're just throwing everything against the wall. Why didn't we hear about this before? You had all these opportunities. Uh, you know, and to, the minority leader of this committee that was weighing Kavanaugh did not think, uh, perhaps, I mean, it has the suggestion of this was worthy enough to investigate. Right. And in some ways, she was, you know, so Dr. Ford she, was failed by that in the sense that, she, you know, she did not come at the last minute. You know, so, as soon as, th this, before he was even nominated, he was only on the short list. And she was telling friends about this before he was even on this list of 10 or so approved uh, I, I want to ask you about your second piece, uh, because uh, this uh, this piece suggests that there could be other pe uh, other uh, people who have uh, information about uh, Judge Ka Kavanaugh that has not come forward. Right. Could you talk about that piece? And also, who is Cyrus Sinai? So he is the uh, is an attorney in California who is the whistleblower who 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 first called out Judge Alex Kaczynski. He was the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit Court, who in December of 2017 was finally brought down by a, a series of Washington Post uh, articles about his sexual harassment in, in the workplace over decades. He, he came out in 2008 uh, and, and made these allegations publicly, filed complaints against this him. This is Sinai, the this attorney. Is, this is Sinai, and, and, and has consistently since then. The Ninth Circuit judges are the ones who police themselves, so Kaczynski stayed on the court until the combination of the media reports and the Me Too movement uh, took him down. And this is so, the famously liberal uh, Ninth Circuit court. Ex ex exactly. That's right. And so because of that, he's become the person that you speak to about issues related to the Ninth Circuit Court. If you're an employee within the, uh, the, th that federal branch, that's who, you, that's who you would logically reach out to, to to talk about blowing the whistle, because he's already persona non grata among, among these judges, and you know he's going to protect your confidence. So after the, my original story came out, he reached out to me and said, you know, I also sent a letter to Chuck Grassley and Feinstein in July saying that there are members of the, you know, uh, the federal court, employees of the federal court who knew, who knew and worked with Kavanaugh and can testify under the right circumstances, if they're protected, that Kavanaugh is lying about what he knew about the judge's behavior. Kavanaugh has, sa has said he was shocked and saddened and appalled. Well, explain right. Kavanaugh's relationship with Judge right. Kaczynski. Right. It's very tight. So not only was he his clerk in the early 90s, he became close friends with him afterwards. And he and Kaczynski vetted the, the clerks 
that went to Anthony Kennedy in the Supreme Court, which is one of the most powerful positions in the legal world to vet Supreme Court justices. Kavanaugh's own clerk last year was Kaczynski's middle son. So these, 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 are, these are very close people. And so— And Kavanaugh was recommended to be Anthony Kennedy's clerk, which he was, by Judge Kaczynski. Yes. And then Kennedy recommended to Trump that Kavanaugh be his replacement. You know, without Kaczynski, you don't have, you don't have Kavanaugh. And so he has distanced himself in, in testimony and in public statements from uh, Kaczynski's behavior. Interestingly, Maisie Hirono followed up to him in written questions. The senator from the sen Hawaii. Senator Maisie Hirono said, please search your email and check to see if you got any sexually inappropriate emails from Kaczynski, because to know him for 20 years like this and to not have is very strange. His reply was, instead of the, the wall of denial that he gave in his testimony, his reply to that was, I do not remember receiving any sexually inappropriate emails. And, that, and that's the end of his written reply. And so now, according to Sanai, there are employees who would say, that's nonsense. I, I know firsthand that Kavanaugh was a witness. Not that Kavanaugh approved of the behavior but that he's lying about this. And his credibility is now central to the accusation of the attempted rape. I, I, I want to get back to the uh, to uh, the claims of uh, Dr. Blasey Ford in terms of there was supposedly another person in the room right. when uh, Kavanaugh allegedly sexually uh, assaulted uh, Professor right. Blasey Ford, a, uh, a guy by the name of uh, Mark Judge. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about Mark Judge, who he is? Yeah, he, he's a known quantity in Washington. Uh, when he was brought out as the character witness uh, for for Judge Kavanaugh, that should have been sending off alarm bells for everyone. It's like bringing out the, the worst guy in your crew as the one that you send to The New York Times to vouch for your character. If Mark Judge is the best you can do. You know, that that is that is that is deeply alarming. Uh, people can just Google Mark Judge and find some of his his past writings, uh, stuff that's uh, racist, that's misogynist. Uh, he has said it's nice that feminists say yes means yes and no means no. But there's a middle ground. Like he has written these words in print, not in not in Facebook posts, not in not in tweets, but like in published articles. Uh, you know, so if, if this is the person uh, who was brought out to deny that he would ever do such a thing. And then it was not surprising to find out that he was the accomplice le named by Dr. Blasey Ford as, as physically and literally in the room. And now uh, Kavanaugh is saying that he wasn't at this party, which is an odd denial because she has not specified you know, what the date was or what the address was. So how you know how that that also raises red flags? How do you deny being at a party that hasn't been specified which party it was? So what happens on Monday? And of course, I mean, yesterday we had an extended discussion about this on Democracy Now, but it brings us back, of course, right. to Anita Hill. Right. And so now, as as Susan Collins said in the sound you played earlier, the question moves from you know, what you know. Is this behavior disqualifying? Because there are a number of Republicans who are who are coming out and saying, "Boys will be boys." And, you know, we should forgive uh, behavior like this by a by a seventeen year old. What Collins has done is is move it to: Is he being truthful about whether or not he did it? And so, a lot of it will come down, unfortunately, um, to how credible the witness appears. And from everything I've been able to gather about her, she is an extremely formidable uh, woman and, and, is, and ha she has a lot, she has passed a lie detector test. She has uh, therapist notes from six years ago. Uh, she, she has other friends that she has confided in. Um, she, she also is somebody who just exudes credibility. Meanwhile, Kavanaugh has demonstrably perjured himself in front of the committee already about whether or not he had, you know, exploited stolen documents back in the back in the 2000s. And back under when he worked for President George W. Right. Bush around the issue of judicial right. nominations. Right. He has said that he did not use these stolen documents. Um, and that's a lie. Like, there are there are emails that prove that he did it. The one of the subject lines in the uh, one of the emails said, "Like here's spy, like spy document. Like you know, it, it's like it's 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 he's been caught red 
handed lying about that particular issue. And so— uh, That goes if, to the issue of perjury, because right. he was asked about He's, it again. He, And he also has said that he knows nothing about Alex Kaczynski's behavior, which other employees will say that's absolutely absurd. This was going on for decades. And so— uh, what well, is your well? What about the issue, though? That uh, obviously in the Anita in the Anita Hill case, uh, she was alleging conduct by the uh, uh, Clarence um, Clarence Thomas, the uh, the Supreme Court nominee, while they were working together. It was harassment by she claimed by him on the job. We're talking here about an incident that happened, as people have said, when one person was fifteen, one was seventeen. Right. If it did happen, uh, what about the differences in terms of the situations involved here? I think one of the interesting Interesting differences, I'd be curious for your take on this, too, is that in, in 1991, the behavior that she was describing, not the specific uh, actions, but the general behavior of men harassing women in the workplace was almost universal. It was, it was so widespread. And so the there but for the grace of God go I uh, attitude of men was much more pronounced and out in the open. Like, they, they, were, they were much less ashamed to, to say, well, maybe we need to change the culture, but the culture today is what it is. There are some men who are hinting that same thing about attempted rape, but it is much, much more difficult to publicly say, who amongst us hasn't tried to rape a woman? You know, that, that, that's a, it's, it's not a, it, people are making that claim uh -huh. in public, but, but many fewer and they're being and they're being called out. And say, are you are you listening to yourself? Or do you do you hear what you're saying? And so, that I think is is a key difference. That the the behavior was s s criticized but broadly accepted in 1991. What what Clarence Thomas was doing, whereas nobody uh, can with a straight face say that. Well, you know who hasn't you know. You know, committed a rape here or there as a teenager. And your response to Trump's response to all of this, saying I, go ahead with the hearings and right, the and delay. I, th I think Trump, like, I think a lot of people are just going to ignore what Trump's position is on this. Trump, <laughs> Trump stood by Roy Moore through multiple credible allegations of, of molesting young girls. Uh, he's, he stood by Rob Porter even after we published photos of uh, what, of the physical abuse he had committed towards his first wife. You know, he is himself boasted of uh, his penchant for sexual assault. So, you know, if Mark Judge and Donald Trump are your character witnesses here, you're in trouble. Ryan Grimm, we want to thank you for being with us. Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief for The Intercept will link to his new piece, Attorney Sent Letter to Chuck Grassley and Diane Feinstein, claiming federal court employees willing to speak about Brett Kavanaugh. And he broke the story that Senator Diane Feinstein had a secret letter from an anonymous uh, woman who was accusing uh, Brett Kavanaugh of attempted rape when they were both in high school. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back in a minute. Bathala, likha ninyo ang bawat bagay sa mundo. Lupang kayo manggit nun ti ang bukirin. Alat ng dagat at tamis ng hangin. Bathala. Pagtupad nito ang lahat ay titimba. Ang tao, inyong hinugis at pinaamon sa lupa, pinagkalooban ng talino at diwa upang mundo. Patala Diri by Bayang Barrios. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, the death toll from Hurricane Florence has reached 32 as rivers in the Carolinas continue to rise from the record-breaking storm. 
While the worst of the hurricane is over, officials say the most dangerous flooding is yet to come for residents of the Carolinas and Virginia, where around half a million homes remain without power. Thousands of residents have been ordered to evacuate their homes, and hundreds more have sought rescue from rising floodwaters. This includes undocumented immigrants in the region who have expressed concern they will encounter immigration enforcement if they seek help. A mother in the coastal city of Wilmington, North Carolina, which is cut off from the rest of the state by floodwaters, told NBC News she feared being separated from her children by ICE if they evacuated to a shelter. My smallest daughter, the little one, asked me, Mom, I'm very afraid that our home is going to be destroyed and I don't want to go to a shelter because I do not want them. I don't want to be separated from you. I'd rather die first than be separated from you. Immigra immigration authorities say they have suspended enforcement actions in areas affected by Hurricane Florence. But tensions remain high. North Carolina is one of the states that pioneered police collaboration with ICE in so-called 287G programs which allow state and local authorities to partner with immigration officials. Federal prosecutors have also demanded millions of the state's voter records be turned over to immigration authorities by the end of the month and have charged 19 foreign nationals of voting without citizenship in the 2016 election. This comes as newly released budget documents show the Trump administration reallocated nearly $10 million from FEMA's budget to ICE to pay for detention space and deportations. FEMA has said it faced staffing shortages and other logistical challenges after Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, where nearly 3,000 people died in the storm and its aftermath, even though President Trump has denied these figures. For more, we go to North Carolina, where we're joined in Durham by Laura Garduña Garcia, an organizer with the American Friends Service Committee, a member of uh, Mi Gente and the immigrant rights organization uh, Siembra North Carolina. She's also a DACA recipient who's lived in North Carolina for the last 20 years. Also with us in D.C. is Mary Small, policy director for Detention Watch Network. She helped expose how the Trump administration diverted the nearly $10 million from FEMA to ICE. She is from North Carolina herself. Um, let's turn first to Lauda. Talk about the impact of the storm in North Carolina and particularly its effect on the immigrant community. Yes, good morning. Um, yeah, so right now, immigrant community members in North Carolina are seeing clear skies. But we know that the dangers of floodwaters are still there in many parts of the of the state. And most alarming is the fact that 44 counties that have been uh, the hardest struck by Hurricane Florence are also in the district of U.S. Attorney Robert um, Higdon, who is basically Jeff Sessions' uh, henchman here in North Carolina, as you stated already. These are the counties where um, officials are acting hand in hand with ICE um, to prosecute individuals who are undocumented for illegal reentry, where there, that is not happening anywhere else in the state. Also, this is the same place um, where, uh, in, in the state of North Carolina, we have now a task force to detect um, fraud, immigration fraud, and document fraud in which the U.S. district attorney is working hand-in-hand -hand with ICE. And in the moment where we are looking at the devastation caused by the hurricane, immigrant families are not able to trust in federal agencies looking out for their well-being and are not able to seek the support from FEMA because of um, their undocumented status. Um, so right now, we know that individuals who are in the community are facing fear, are facing distrust of federal agencies, and are in imminent need of resources and support to come out from the, the hurricane and the storm. So I think that that, that, is, that is just very difficult for community members to have to deal with. Um, and so anyone who is watching at this moment, who is looking at images of North Carolina, parts of North Carolina underwater, um, we know that FEMA is not going to get to all the individuals that need this help the most, 
So this is the moment when donations are very important so that community members have the resources and the help that they need to come out of this storm. And we can do so by donating to tiny.cc backslash Florence. Uh, Laura, I wanted to ask you, the, um, the ICE officials have said that they won't be doing any active enforcement uh, uh, actions during evacuations or in the shelters uh, as a result of Hurricane Florence. Uh, but what's your sense of what is going on? Because we've seen in the past, as you mentioned with FEMA, whether it was in, in, in Texas or in Florida, that once the issue of uh, rebuilding occurs, uh, those folks who are undocumented then come deal with the reality that the federal government, especially FEMA, is not going to be uh, responsive to uh, claim some of the undocumented. Right. Um, so I think the first part of, uh, of the question is, what are community members feeling, right? If, if we are told Immigration Customs Enforcement is saying we're not going to conduct enforcement operations at this time in the communities that have been affected by Florence, um, we have reason to distrust any statement that that agency puts out. Um, because in the past, they haven't abided by the statements that they have made. And furthermore, part of the emergency response um, agents that are coming to the state are in Customs and Border Patrol vehicles and uniforms. That in no way cements trust between community members and the federal agencies. When we know what Customs and Border Patrol are meant to do. And it is just appalling the total disregard to community members who are facing the devastation following the, the storm to then come out and looking for help or looking for supplies to take back to their homes and then find everywhere in the eastern part of the state Customs and Border Patrol vehicles. It is totally unacceptable, and FEMA should not be engaging in these tactics. Mm. I want to bring Mary Small into this discussion. She's executive director of Detention Watch Network. You helped expose the $10 million taken from FEMA um, and given diverted to ICE. Can you explain what you learned? So the documents that were released uh, just recently are actually sort of the culmination of a multi-year tracking process. So over the last three years, ICE has really perfected this scheme where they've ratcheted up the funding that they use for detention and deportation twice per year. So they get an increase from Congress, and so Congress isn't on this, too. And then they overspend their money and make up the difference by grabbing money from other parts of the agency. And then they get a bump, and then they overspend, and then they grab more money. And the, by repeating this three times, they've moved a billion additional dollars into the account that they use for detention and deportation. The documents that were released very recently showed the most recent of these grabbing money from other accounts. And it's actually $200 million uh, that they pulled from different parts of the agency. So the $10 million that they took from FEMA is one part of this kind of bigger story of— financial manipulation by this agency to drive more and more resources into uh, building and expanding the detention and deportation machine that is, that's, you know, reflected in what Laura is talking about on the ground in North Carolina. Uh, I wanted to ask you—my uh, understanding is that, that ICE alone is spending about $3.6 billion on detention and transportation of the undocumented. Is, uh, could you talk about this explosion of the amount of money spent on detaining and uh, transporting, or, uh, that which, could, which could also mean deporting, uh, uh, the undocumented immigrants? Yeah, I think that that outrage is really well placed at this massive sum of money um, is going to open up new detention facilities, including really big detention facilities that, that are operated by private prison companies, um, and, as you say, transporting people for, for deportation, so really putting into practice uh, some of the worst and most harmful policies um, for communities. And I think that, wh while I'm really glad that the, the fact that money was taken from FEMA um, to be moved into this detention and deportation account— um, is, is really coming to light in a major way. I think we also have to zoom out even further to understand that it's not just FEMA that money is coming from, right? These precious taxpayer dollars could be going to housing or education or health care or any number of other things that actually help communities thrive together and be whole and intact um, rather than so, uh, so violently and aggressively separating them.
Now, FEMA agency spokesperson Tyler Holton said, under no circumstances was any disaster relief funding transferred from FEMA to immigration enforcement efforts. This is a sorry attempt to push a false agenda at a time when the administration's focused on assisting millions on the East Coast facing a catastrophic disaster. Mary, your response to this? I think that's really just parsing words. I mean, the transfer and reprogramming request uh, that we were able uh, to get a hold of and share with congressional offices shows precisely that, that money can be moved around between accounts. And so, to say the money that was taken was maybe slated for something other than emergency response isn't responsive to the fact that it could have been used for that. And at a time where uh, where Puerto Rico is so desperately still in need of assistance, where FEMA is talking about staffing shortages, the money could have been shifted into those functions rather than into detention and deportation. Mm. And what about now in the rebuilding, as I, as I raised before, in the rebuilding process after the storm? What's the, uh, what's the legal situation for those who may be undocumented uh, in terms of being able to get any kind of uh, disaster assistance? Um, I'm not the best um, person to oh, speak to that. that. Oh, go ahead. So, Laura, you want to talk about that? Not yes. able to access— I'm sorry? Laura, go ahead. Um, yes. Uh, we know that individuals who are undocumented are not able to access um, the support or resources from uh, FEMA. So there, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people in the past who have been left out by the federal agency. And we expect that that will happen again in the state of North Carolina, which is why we call to action by making donations to grassroots organizations who are who understand that not only immigrant communities have been left behind but historically black communities have been left in the dark after hurricanes in the past like we saw in Katrina for months if not years at a time so grassroots organizations are mobilizing right now and individuals who are able to should be looking at making donations directly to these grassroots organizations um, at tiny.cc backslash Florence. We want to thank you both for being with us, Laura Garduño Garcia, immigrant organizer in North Carolina, and Mary Small, Detention Watch Network. And as we go out, Laura, what is your uh, message to immigrants, especially undocumented people, in, uh, in, in the midst of this storm, even as the floodwaters rise? Um, my message to my the people in my community here in the state where I call home is that you should find support in local organizations who will look to you will, who will look to you to find what they are able to provide to you and and um, are so willing to put forward their best effort to fill the gaps that the federal agency will leave behind, no question. But we must come forward with our requests, with our needs, and we should find uh, local groups um, and or create our own to support one another in these times, because not only are we facing the devastation of Hurricane Florence, but we know that we will continue facing attacks on our immigrant community, and together we are stronger. Thank you so much. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, it's the 10th anniversary of the economic collapse of Lehman Brothers collapsing, also the 7th anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. We'll speak with Occupy activist Nathan Schneider. His new book, Everything for Everyone. Stay with us. Nothing from Nothing by Billy Preston here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Well, this week marks the seventh anniversary of the Occupy Wall Street movement and 10 years since the collapse of U.S. investment bank Lehman Brothers that triggered the onset of the global financial crisis. 
Millions of people in the United States and around the world lost their jobs, lost their homes and life savings, even as the U.S. government bailed out some of Wall Street's biggest failing banks. Over the weekend, activists in Europe protested outside banks in France and Germany to mark the 10th anniversary. The financial crisis also sparked massive global anti-capitalist movements, including the Occupy movement here in the U.S. and M15 in Spain and the anti-austerity movements in Greece. To talk more about the impacts of the crisis 10 years later, we're joined by Nathan Schneider, whose new book outlines an alternative economic model based on cooperative ownership. He argues the cooperative movement has witnessed a resurgence since the 2008 financial crisis. Schneider's book is just out. It's called Everything for Everyone, the Rod tradition that's shaping the next economy. His recent piece for Vice is headlined, Rich People Broke America and Never Paid the Price. He's also author of Thank You, Anarchy, Notes from the Occupy Apocalypse. Uh, Nathan Schneider is a journalist and author and media studies professor at University of Colorado Boulder. Welcome to Democracy Now! I just came from Boulder. Um, uh, so, talk about this both 10th anniversary of what's called the economic collapse, but also— um, um, seventh anniversary of Occupy, which you were very much a part of. Well, it's striking how little we are marking these anniversaries, right? Especially the anniversary of the, cra the, uh, the, of the crash, which has so defined the last 10 years and has defined my generation, has defined so many of our lives. I think a reason that we haven't been celebrating it is we recognize we really haven't done anything serious to deal with the causes of this crash and to deal with the horrific response to it in which millions of people were allowed to lose their homes and their jobs. And uh, quietly, in the midst of this lack of imagination, there has been a growing uh, uh, movement on a grassroots level, uh, increasingly at a policy level, uh, to recognize that there is an opportunity to make a difference through this tradition of cooperative enterprise. Well, can you give some examples of that? Because, as, as you note, there has been a, 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 a cooperative movement in America in p past decades as well, even before this crisis. But how do you see—give some examples of uh, the changes that have occurred since the crash. Well, absolutely. There has been that long tradition, and it's—I uh, mean, this is a tradition that has been— uh, empowering farmers, that has been uh, uh, enabling small businesses to survive, but it's often not visible. You know, actually, in the course of working on this book, I learned that my own grandfather uh, uh, helped build a national purchasing cooperative for hardware stores, enabling small hardware stores to survive and thrive, you know. And I didn't even know that it was a cooperative. That was never something I, I learned. And um, in the years since the, the crash, um, for instance, there was, uh, a, in 2011, during Occupy, there was a large Move Your Money Day, where hundreds of thousands of accounts moved from big banks to credit unions, which are banks that are owned by the people they serve. Uh, there's been a rise in interest across the country, especially in cities, in worker ownership, in allowing workers to become owners of the businesses that where they're uh, employed. And this is increasingly moving uh, into to, uh, federal strategy. Uh, and it's a surprisingly bipartisan opportunity. There's a quiet opportunity here uh, to really make good on the, um, the failure of our economic system 10 years ago. Mm. Well, but uh, some might argue that um, uh, even some predatory capitalists have come up with uh, or are developing the idea of uh, cooperation uh, among business people. Uh, I'm thinking of Airbnb, uh, Uber, uh, this whole sharing economy. Uh, they're sort of taking co a cooperative idea uh, and standing it on its head in terms of how they can make money off. That's right. You know, cooperation was really the original crowdfunding. It was the original sharing economy. But I think most of us have kind of wised up to the fact that this is not a real sharing economy, this economy of Uber and Airbnb. This is an extraction economy. And a lot of what I've been following for the last few years is a group of people around the world who are trying to build real sharing economies, using digital tools to share ownership and governance all the way down, to build gig economies where frontline workers are uh, deciding their own, their own standards of work, you know, house cleaners and, and, uh, and drivers drivers and others. This is you speaking at Occupy Wall Street. The anniversary, seventh anniversary, was Monday, yesterday, uh, September 17th. But this is you speaking there, um, down at Zuccotti Park. 
What they're doing here is the assembly. The core demand, I think, right now seems to be um, the, de the, the right to organize, to have a political conversation in a public space, to show Wall Street, uh, so to speak, what democracy looks like. So that's you, Nathan Schneider, back seven years ago. And now you've written this book. Um, this radical tradition you're talking about, the cooperatives that are um, uh, on the upswing around the world, talk more about them specifically and what you hold out most hope for. Well, it, it's striking how that idea of practicing democracy in everyday life that was that was happening in that square um, is something that is a kind of hope that we've lost. Uh, it was something that even in the 1930s and 40s, the U.S. government was promoting. Uh, it was something that a possibility that was forgotten. In terms of these particular uh, projects, you know, we, we have uh, these gig economies in which uh, people are, are figuring out how to own and govern their own platforms. Uh, we're seeing uh, uh, an opportunity uh, unlike any we've ever seen, where a whole generation of business owners uh, in what's known as the silver tsunami are looking to retire. And these small and medium-sized businesses, employers around the country are being gobbled up by uh, private equity. This is an opportunity for conversion to employee ownership um, if we have the right policy tools and the right financing tools available. Um, so the opportunities that, we're, uh, that we have before us right now are tremendous. And these are also connected to our social movements. You know, the, uh, the, the platform for the Black Lives Matter movement uh, mentioned in its policy proposals cognates of cooperation more than 40 times. And this is just uh, uh, another example of the rootedness of our social movements in cooperative enterprise, uh, going back to the civil rights movement and long before. And, and what do you say to those who would argue that, uh, absent any kind of uh, change in the political power structure, that the, that the lawmakers will always come up with ways to keep these cooperative movements down and to maintain uh, monopoly capital or big capital uh, uh, in, uh, in favor status in a society? Well, the, the weird thing is, actually, this is something that's happening across the political spectrum, but quietly. You know, actually, both the Democratic and Republican platforms in 2016 uh, advocate increasing worker ownership. Um, now, in the last couple of years, uh, Democrats have been recognizing that this might be an issue that they want to take leadership on. Uh, uh, just a couple uh, uh, weeks ago, the Main Street Employee Ownership Act passed, which uh, facilitates uh, worker ownership and conversions of businesses. So I think, actually, we have an interesting opportunity in this moment of incredible polarization, and there's a political base already starting to form. We just need to strengthen that. That. And 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 make the demand uh, even louder. Make the demand heard that that system that created the crash ten years ago is not acceptable anymore. What's the difference between the gig economy and the rigged economy? <laughs> Well, I, I think a rigged economy, right, is one in which the, um, the, the accountability goes upward, you know, in which you have businesses that are ultimately accountable just to a small segment of uh, their shareholders, of, of big investors. They're not—when they have to make hard decisions, their accountability goes upward, and the people who are, say, on the line for uh, their mortgages are the ones who get let off. You know, the gig economy is— in a sense, an opportunity and a danger. The gig economy is a danger in the sense that it means it has often meant relinquishing things that workers have fought for for decades, for, for centuries. Um, but it also invites these opportunities of more flexible work. And we have an opportunity to, to, to create a future of work that, in which workers are really in control. And finally, the fact that who was held accountable for what happened and how much so many people lost 10 years ago? Well, I, I think we haven't really held anyone accountable nearly enough. And the, the, um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, or, or there was some talk uh, uh, for, for some seconds. of the time about uh, uh, who was not put in jail, things like that. I think we need to talk about the system. We need to transform the system, and we have a tool set. We have a tradition that is proven, that is actually bipartisan, uh, that we can turn to. 
to make that difference. Nathan Schneider, media studies professor at University of Colorado Boulder. His new book, Everything for Everyone, The Radical Tradition That's Shaping the Next Economy. That does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Thanks so much for joining us.